Hello, welcome to the British Library this evening. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight. I'm John, I look after the events programme at the Library. And also welcome to those watching at home online with an awful lot of you out there tonight, which is great. So tonight we're absolutely delighted to be launching uh, Dr Julius Shaw's new book, by the Hidden Culture, History and Science of Bisexuality. And those of you who were lucky enough to be here in the British Library three or four years ago when we uh, did an event on her last best-selling book, Making Evil, on the science behind humanity's dark side, will know that she is a brilliant psychologist and brings a fascinating insight into some of the most interesting areas of the human character and human behaviour. So Dr Shaw is a criminal psychologist at University College London. She is also part of queer politics at Princeton University, which works for LGBT plus equality, democracy, and civil rights. And she's founder of the International Bisexual Research Group. And you may also know Dr. Shaw from her hit BBC podcast, Bad People, where her and her co-host uses the hit research to examine some of society's most pressing issues. So please do pick up a copy of the book outside, hot off the press, and do stop to have it signed. And those watching online can also buy a copy by visiting the Books tab at the top of your screen. And in a short while, um, Dr Shaw will be in conversation with Ben Hunt, who we're also delighted is joining us tonight. He is Senior Reporter for Vice World News. Previously, he was also the BBC's first LGBT plus correspondent and also runs the Find Your Voice Academy, which offers a confidence-building programme for school children. At the end of the conversation, there'll be a short Q&A, and those watching online can submit questions via the form just below the video window, and we'll read some of those out later on. That's it from me. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Julia Shaw. Hello. I am... So pleased to be here with all of you today and to celebrate the launch of my book, Bye. I have decided today to create a completely artificial intelligence designed presentation. So all of the art is by Dali, which is an artificial intelligence. We can talk about that in the discussion later if you'd like. Uh, but I'm also going to be doing something I never do, which is effectively a speech for the first few minutes. And then I'm going to enter into conversation with the incredible Ben Hunt. So. Are you ready for this? <laughs> a few years ago, I was in San Francisco, that queerest of capitals in one of the queerest of bookstores, and I asked for the bisexual section. I was greeted by only a handful of books, and that was the day I learned that bisexuality has an abysmal amount of space on the bookshelf of queer lives. I remember thinking, why aren't we here? Where are all the bisexuals? It was from that point on that I came to understand that we have untethered bisexual people from their own culture, history, and science. But it was also from that point on that I learned that if we dig deep, reading old, dusty books, searching for representation in historical archives, and learning the academies of our identities, we can find a whole by universe. Already in the 1940s, sex researcher Alfred Kinsey criticized scholars who insisted on turning sexuality into a binary. As he wrote in a critique of his contemporaries, more basic than any error brought out in the analysis is the assumption that homosexuality and heterosexuality are two mutually exclusive phenomena. Data derived from such faulty assumptions can only lead to an entrenching into science of moralizing conclusions about how sexuality should be rather than how it is. Instead, Kinsey found that the true picture of sexuality is one of endless intergradation between hetero and homosexual, and he reconceptualized sexuality as a continuum. Research has found that a quarter to half of all people are in the middle of this continuum, between zero, exclusively heterosexual, and six, exclusively homosexual. 
although rarely used by the people who fall into this mix of hetero and homosexual, the word for it, the hidden, erased, stigmatized, beautiful, rebellious, accurate word for it, is bisexual. And while we are just deconstructing binaries, note that the bi in bisexual means two, but not the two you probably think. The bi in bisexual does not stand for the gender binary, men and women. Bisexual was coined in the late 1800s to describe those who had both homo and heterosexual attractions, so to same and other genders. Today, the most common definition of bisexuality is a sexual and or romantic attraction to multiple genders. But when I was just a candy-colored baby bi girl, I knew none of this. I knew whom I loved, but I didn't know where I belonged. I went to my first pride march and thought it had nothing to do with me because I was never taught my own history and I never thought to ask. That's what erasure does. It steals our ability to ask the right questions. It simplifies who am I to am I. Researchers found that compared to lesbian and gay people, bisexuals are the least likely to be part of queer groups. This has been linked to comparatively high rates of isolation, anxiety, depression, substance use, and non-suicidal self-injury. It seems that without the buffer of community, being told repeatedly that you don't exist can lead to your own annihilation. And to all the candy-colored baby bi girls today, I'm so Sorry. Yes, things are better, but they aren't better enough. Research published in 2020 found that bisexual girls are more often bullied, touched without their consent, and are judged more harshly for their behavior and dress than their peers. They are assumed to be promiscuous, making them subject to what has been referred to as a slut discourse. Slut discourse is the parasitic stalker that follows bisexuals everywhere. Tell people you are bi and their brains glitch to threesomes and sexual insatiability. The toxic assumption that bi people are untrustworthy partners unable to be monogamous. That we are performing our sexuality for them and that everything we are and everything we have is for them to take. We carry slut discourse into universities where bisexual women are more likely to be sexually assaulted and less likely to receive appropriate counseling services than their peers. Into workplaces where bisexuals are given a bisexuality penalty when coming out because, compared to homosexuality, saying you're bi is seen as inappropriate, too much, too sexual. Into relationships where studies have found that 61% of bisexual women and 37% of bisexual men experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate <coughs> partner in their lifetime. Rates far higher than experienced by homo or heterosexual people. We carry it into justification for the horrifying practices of conversion therapy and corrective rape. There is an alternative to slut discourse, which is denial. Perhaps you're accused of lying because you're actually gay. Told you need to prove it. Show me. To count as bi, society tells us that our word is not enough. This carries over into our refugee policies, where bisexual asylum seekers are denied access to safety because it is assumed that they can just pretend to be straight, or worse, that they are lying about being bi, about being persecuted by the state and their own families. I've given many reasons for people to stay in silence, in the big bi closet, hidden away where most people will live forever. Research has found that bi people are invisible in most spheres of their lives. Bisexuals are less than half as likely as homosexuals to be out to their partners, to their parents, to their own children, and to their colleagues. And compared to bi women, bi men are even less likely to be out because of how bisexuality is seen to destabilize masculinity. People can also be more than one color of the rainbow. Many non-binary and trans people also identify as bi, but their bisexual identity is typically erased and eclipsed by their gender <coughs> identity. So what should bisexuals do? Should we hide until society changes, collectively hush until it's safer to come out? As activist Audre Lorde wrote, your silence will not protect you. 
It's been over 130 years of research and activism on and for by lives, and we are still fighting the same fights. It's time for a new strategy, to come out and say what we stand for. To all of those attracted beyond gender, if you can, I wish for you to say, I am bisexual. And I will not sit down until you recognize and include us in your conversations about diversity. And there's no perfect time to come out. We can wait and wait and wait, saying one day we will show the world our shimmering, true, beautiful by colors. But if we wait for the perfect moment, we will fail. As Audrey Lorde said about standing up against oppression, while we wait in silence for that final luxury of fearlessness, the weight of silence will choke us. Visibility is essential to affording by people around the world human rights. The psychological idea known as the contact hypothesis has repeatedly found evidence for the benefits of knowing people from other groups to reduce intergroup conflict, discrimination, and fear. That means knowing someone who is bisexual, your child, your parent, your teacher, your colleague, your friend, or even seeing people <coughs> in the media or on TV who are openly bisexual makes it much harder to say that we don't exist, that we are other, less than, perverted, that we don't deserve protection. Visibility saves lives. Visibility is beautiful. And while there may be darkness in the world around us, no matter where we live or what adversity we are currently going through, light still resides in our hearts. Research has found that despite the negative aspects that I just introduced you to, most bi people love being bisexual. And the most common word they use to explain why is freedom. Freedom to love without regard for biological sex or gender. Freedom from social labels and gender roles. Freedom to explore diverse relationships and experiences. And freedom of sexual expression. This is not to say that monosexuals are not free, but rather that embracing who you are is an exercise in freedom. We can also find freedom in the stories of our bisexual ancestors in research that validates the collective challenges of those who are a blend of homo and heterosexual, and in the victories of bi activists. And it is when we uncover all of these that we find solid ground for the beautiful bisexual desires that are all around and perhaps even inside of us. No matter what your own sexuality is, I want to help you ask yourself new questions about who you are and how you love and to open your heart to new possibilities. I poured all of me and all of the research I could find on bisexuality and a whole master's degree in queer history into this book. Or as sometimes people say, I did the research so you don't have to. <laughs> I wrote this book that I had been searching for that time years ago in that bookstore in San Francisco. My wish is that when you read by, you use it to deconstruct toxic misconceptions and fuel bisexual inclusion, to build a world where all the candy-colored bisexuals can live happily amongst the rainbow gumdrops, and to ask yourself new questions that allow you to go deeper into your own sexuality. And remember to never stop fighting for love, because sexual freedom is magnificent and fragile. Thank you. Hey everybody, how you doing? Sit over here. You good? Oh gosh, they're very quiet during your talks. <laughs> so, like maybe this is how we are in the British Library. I'm like, oh gosh. Um, hello, my name is Ben Hunt. Uh, I am senior reporter for Vice World News. Previously, I was the BBC's first LGBT correspondent. Um, a little woo there, thank you. Uh, don't get woo too often for the BBC these days. Uh, but yes, it was, it was a good time, it was a good time. I feel like we did some good work. I did some stories about bio people, which always got good traction because the community is huge and uh, very engaged, shall we say, <laughs> on social media. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation today uh, with Julia, so thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, firstly, you did kind of touch on it, but I'd love to understand more about what made you want to write this book? Like, what was it that pushed you to get this done? Oh, by the way, I'm so 
thrilled, <laughs> thrilled that you are here, partly because I saw those documentaries and um, just your work is incredible. So I, I look forward to talking about some of your um, just heartbreaking and incredible documentaries around LGBT people in countries where it's illegal to engage in homosexual behavior oh, yes. and LGBT free zones. And we'll talk about that later. It's all heartbreaking and amazing coverage that you've done. And also this is interactive as well, let's yeah. not forget. So we are gonna have like a Q and A session. So feel free to store up your questions and then we'll ask you at the end. And also if you're online, you can write somewhere, I guess. Um, and then we will kind of like take them from the ether and put them to you and yeah, we'll make it happen, so yeah. Perfect. So, so what made you want to write this book? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this book. There's two, there's two real answers. Both, there's two different answers that are both correct. The one that I usually give is that I had so many questions about bisexuality that I was like, I want answers. And as a scientist and someone who values research, I enjoyed anthologies and I enjoyed the coming out stories that existed. But I found it very difficult to find the answers and the research studies that I wanted as answers to my questions. So I, I, and I think because I come from a history of quantitative analysis and quantitative data where we're trying to like look for averages, like on average, what is the experience? You don't really, it's hard to get from an anthology because you get one story at a time, which is more qualitative, which is great, but not what I needed. And so I was looking for lots of different kinds of research and put it into this book. There's another version of that story. <laughs> is this the real tea? This is. Two things can exist at the same time. Of course, of course. The other version of this is that I was, I was over having to prove my bisexuality slash having that conversation with everybody whom I told I was bi. It was like I was answering the same questions on repeat and it, it got really boring and it got really, oh, I just, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. And then I thought, wow, I bet every single bisexual person who comes out has to do this for the rest of their lives. Yeah. I mean, there's that joke that you come out as bi and then you come out and you come out and you come out. And, because you just have to keep doing it. Because what does a bi person look, to look like and how do you keep being visible? So on the one hand, answering all the questions I had. On the other hand, hopefully giving people a book that I can just shove at them when they come out and <laughs> read it. I like that. Cool. Um, I learned a lot from this book, a lot. Uh, I thought that I knew by life. I thought I understood it. And digging deeper into some of these studies was just incredible. It was so great to just have this research available in very concise chapters that kind of break it all down for you. I learned about starfish being queer mascots. I learned about um, sheep dating apps, which was incredible. Um, I learned so much about just bi life in general and what it means to people internationally. Uh, was there anything that really surprised you when you were writing this book? I feel like there's someone out there watching who's like, sheep dating app, spy life. Read the book. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm plugging you with the best bits. Here we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was all about looking for the bi gene. Yes. And how it turns out that there's a lot of research on the sexuality and genetics of sheep because a lot of sheep don't like to breed. They're homosexual. And so there's mm -hmm. been a lot of geneticists who are like trying to break sheep DNA to like fix this breeding problem within agriculture. <laughs> and it's a much nicer, also because you can, right? Like you can yes. actually go into sheep DNA and change it, whereas with humans you should not. Um, <laughs> and so I, I was using that as, a, as an interesting sort of sideline as like, oh, look, there's all this, so, by the way, there's all this research on sheep sex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a great chapter. That's really good, it was really good. Uh, but by culture. Yes. What was the question? It was. What, <laughs> I just felt like I wanted to disentangle the sheep was sex there, from bi culture. Was there anything really juicy that you found out while you were writing this book? Anything that really surprised you about bi life? Lots of things surprised me. So I knew very little about being bi except for being bi mm. uh, until I wrote this book. So I'd only just started talking more to friends who, who it turns out, like, in like one wave, all came out to me. I was like, oh, yeah, me too. And I was like, oh, how oh, have we never discussed this earlier? But that's what happens, is if you are part of an invisible population, of course you are worried about coming out potentially, which is why you haven't. And so that moment when somebody else says, I am bi, is the moment you go, oh, it's safe. I can do it now. And you can say, me too. And that's when, I mean, that's the only times really I've ever had people come out to me as bi, is when I first said that that's what I am. And I think that taught me a lot about bisexuality, even just realizing that lots of my friends had never 
had that conversation with that we'd never had that conversation and that was a bit heartbreaking but I learned in the research and by writing this book that there is a lot of shared experience and shared commisery there's a, there's a commisery mm -hmm. also that comes with aspects of by life which yeah are often the result of hypersexualization and that slut discourse that I mentioned, which I think it can feel very lonely and very like, oh, well, this thing happened to me or, you know, I was sexualized in this way and it felt really weird or it was really horrible. And is it just me or is it something else? And the answer is it's something else. And there's unfortunately a lot of people who have suffered that as well. But there is a unity in suffering that can bring, that can bring strength yes. and also help us fight for change. I love that. And to be honest, that's actually what drives me in my reporting, if I'm being honest. Um, when I was at the BBC, people always expected me to be like this big shiny unicorn, like this glittery being, that would just like show up and give you like rainbow news about stuff. And I wasn't, I was a real dark cloud, like over the rainbow, just like, remember about suicide, trigger warning. <laughs> and like, hate crimes are happening and all of this. And it is, it's tough, but ultimately, like this is real life. This is real life. Uh, and I think it's, that's what, for me, was so fascinating about this book, was reading about the trauma and some of the really terrible things that have happened to people that they have kept silent about because they didn't feel comfortable with sharing it because of their bisexuality and because they felt invisible. Um, it was mega. Um, can I do a quick poll, actually? We talked about it with the British Library yesterday about who would come to something like this. If you are a proud bisexual, uh, can you put your hand in the air, please? Oh! There we go. I told you. So See? many! You came, you came. <laughs> um, Look around! <laughs> <laughs> We're all here! They <laughs> really are. Um, so, I want to understand who this book is for. Is it for um, the person who's trying to understand more about bisexuality, who isn't bisexual themselves? Is it for the bisexual who wants to understand more about the wider community? Um, is it for a parent of uh, a bi child who's just come out to them? Who do you say it for? <laughs> that is a question I ask myself the whole way through writing this book, the whole way through talking about this book. I basically wrote it for two purposes. One, it's primarily for and about bisexuals, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> but that is in its most inclusive term. And so also just to be clear, when I use the term bi, I include other plurisexual identities. So basically anyone who's attracted to people of multiple genders. And that includes pansexual, omnisexual, plurisexual, polysexual. There's other terms. For me, those are all within bi. And that's typically how the research also deals with the many different flavors of uh, sort of labels that people use to describe themselves. And that's not saying that bi is necessarily, you know, qualitatively somehow better. It's just the oldest. And I, I think it's... We'll go into that. We'll anyway. get into you know, that's that. on my list. We'll get into the <laughs> bi pan wars. Um, but, but yeah, so the that sort of community aspect of bringing us all together and saying, hey, this is your history. Like, this is our history. This is research on us. This is, this is fuel that you can use to change the discourse about why. Because how many times have you heard, why does it matter? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times, even with this book, people yeah. are like, oh, so boring, it doesn't apply to me, why does it matter? Come on! And if you were, if I wrote a book about love without couching it as bi, or about human rights without couching it as bi, or about relationships without couching it as bi, everyone would be like, oh, it's a book on relationships, great. Yes. Because the default and the assumption is it's probably about heterosexual relationships, and that's what everyone wants to know about. Yes. And as soon as you add the bi, it's suddenly this like, well, it's a bit niche. <laughs> <laughs> Well, isn't like, that niche? We've exactly. got all of these people here ready to buy the book. <laughs> like, it can't be that niche. Well, and that's right. And if you look at the research on how many people, even though the, most people don't use the word bi for lots of reasons, including societal biophobia, unfortunately, uh, most people don't use the word bi, but a lot of people have attractions to multiple genders at some point in their lives. And I think it's a beautiful thing to encourage people to accept that within themselves and to see love where they find it and not to ignore or erase it within themselves. So mm -hmm. that's, so I want it to be for bi people and people who know or recognize within themselves the capacity for love beyond gender. But I also wrote it as an encyclopedia for anyone who's interested in including queer lives and discourses. 
And that can be parents of queer kids, that can be uh, grandparents, that can be friends, that can be partners, that can be teachers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was speaking to an independent um, sort of a queer bookstore who does a lot of orders for, for schools. And they were saying, oh, we, we've never had a book that we could send to schools on bisexuality, which also is just mind blowing, by the way. Um, and so I'm hoping that it will go into those spaces as well and inform educators and people who structure systems to make better decisions and to create more bi-inclusive spaces. Let's make it happen, yes. Um, so it's for everybody. <laughs> yes, yeah, literally buy the book. Uh, one of the biggest things that I hear at the moment, because I'm still working within like the LGBT space and getting DMs all the time from ultimately unnecessary people <laughs> that throw shade about the wildest things that are going on in the world. But uh, today I had a DM from somebody who said that this event should have been called pansexuality. Um, and actually that this isn't a trans inclusive event. And as a result, they will not be coming. I just wanted to understand your perspective on that um, and how that kind of sits in because you've talked about it being a trans inclusive term. You see the, the term bisexual as trans inclusive. This person saying that no, only pansexual is trans inclusive. Um, and I have spoken to other bi people who say that actually they don't even like the term pansexual because they feel that pansexual erases bisexual. Julia, what's going on? <laughs> Help me. <laughs> the great bi pan wars. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay, step one. Yeah. Break Whatever down. you want to call yourself, you go and call yourself. Yeah. Step two, don't erase other people's identities is also within that. So if someone calls themselves bi and you choose the word pan because you prefer it for whatever reason, don't erase bisexual identities. Just like I'm not going to erase pansexual identities. However, I would oh. like to empower with history. So one of the things that I think is currently going on with why there's been a bit of a move against bi as a word is because there's been so much chat, which has been wonderful, about deconstructing the gender binary. We have been talking in a new way, certainly within my lifetime, about what gender means and whether we can be things like non-binary and what that means and what that experience is like. And so because when we hear bi right now, all we think of is the gender binary because that is the main dominating conversation. The assumption is that bisexual erases non-binary and people who don't fit within that gender binary because we're assuming that bi means men and women, but that is not what it is meant. And that is not the history of bi. Side note, do we know what the history of pan is? Tell us. We're ready. We're, we're so ready. <laughs> so bi has existed as a word for about 130 years and was shortly, coined shortly after heterosexual and homosexual to include people who had all the attractions basically that were known at the time. And so that's why I like the word bi because from the beginning it's been used in this way. And pansexual, which again, like I feel like just like nobody knows the history of these things. The original use of the term pansexual had nothing to do with gender. Just to be clear, just like bi wasn't men and women, pan wasn't all genders. Pansexual was a critique of Freud's work about making everything about sex. As in, he's so pansexual, he reduces everything and all psychological problems to sex. That sort of joke like, ah, if you're feeling depressed, it means you want to have sex with your mom. Like that kind of thing. <laughs> Freud. <laughs> and so it's, reducing everything to sex. And so that's where the word came from. And then it was claimed by kink communities and it was claimed at some point, I think it was the 90s, for the first time by people as an identity marker. But it, that's not where it comes from. So I think understanding the histories of these words also allows us to make better choices as to which histories we would like to buy into. And again, there are of course words change and pan now means something else than it did then. And for some people maybe buy now means something else than it did then. Um, but I prefer buy and just whatever you do, try not to use it as, don't weaponize labels as like, you don't exist or you shouldn't exist or you're phobic of something because of the label you use. I think that's interesting though, because the younger generation definitely is doing that. Um, I was in 
<laughs> I told you I was going to plug this somehow, didn't I? I told you I was going to. So I run a confidence academy for young people. He does. And <laughs> um, I usually take off my Fridays and I go around the country and I just speak to young people in schools uh, and I deliver this masterclass. It basically gives them a kick up the bum to just get their lives together. Because uh, I felt like I didn't get that when I was growing up. I just needed someone to come and just be like, you know, this is literally your life. Like, you're in control of this. Like, do you want to work in Greg's for the rest of your life or do you want to go and, like, be a doctor or whatever? Else. Like it's, it's up to you what you do. Um, so I run this masterclass and I had a school last year where I went into it and I always expect for these young people to kind of be um, excited to see me and tell them all about queer stuff and like being themselves and loving themselves and whatever else. And the masterclass is for six to nine year olds, 10 to 12 year olds and 13 to 18 year olds. And I had one of my 13 to 18 year old classes in like the north of this country, I won't say specifically where it was. And I went in and not a single young person identified as straight. They were all pansexual. <coughs> And it blew my mind because I was expecting to tell them all about Stonewall and about LGBT hate crimes, like what's going on. They were like, actually, Ben, like let me tell you, in the LGBT club last week in school, we actually covered this. And like your dates are incorrect. Like the people you're, you're pronouncing the name wrong. Like you're using whatever. And it was incredible. And I'm seeing now that this younger generation is just so passionate about sexuality and so passionate about gender identity, which is incredible. Um, but I am seeing like the decline of bisexuality within that. Um, and I just wondered if that is kind of a generational split then that you are going to see like the old, I'm not saying we're old, but like the older people who are fighting for bisexual whilst the younger ones are saying actually it's pan now. Ultimately, if people want to call themselves pan, I can only say it again, go for it. And as long as that isn't used to fracture the community and the research on the community, which I think is harmful, then I think that's fine. I think that, again, there's a question as to why. And sometimes the reason why is biphobic and mm -hmm. is actually not a, a lack of acceptance that most people who use the word bi and most people use the word pan, according to research, define their, themselves in the same way and define their attractions in the same way. So I think we're introducing friction where there isn't any mm -hmm. often. And we're just sort of making up differences that don't exist and really confuse the heterosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> we like that, though. We do that. People are like, yeah, but... Just a little bit of that. But pan and bi and like, oh, you have all these names. <laughs> it's true. I mean, even when Layla Moran came out as pansexual, I was in the BBC newsroom on that day and they were just like, get Ben on. We, like, we need someone to talk about this. And it was wild because suddenly you had all of these newsrooms scrambling for an understanding of a term that had existed, that people had come out as, but because someone within their bubble um, and within like public conscience had actually come out as it, suddenly we all had to talk about it. Um, so for the first time, I think pansexual did trend on that day and we were all talking about it. And so, a yeah. lot of memes of pans. I oh, really. <laughs> I remember this day. Oh, yeah. Twitter, gosh. But as someone, so you identify as gay, right? Ooh. Is this the moment this you is, come out as but, bi? Well, you know what's it's, what's interesting about this, and we obviously we were talking before about it, is um, I feel like my bi card was snatched away from me, uh, and I feel like I was almost pushed out of that community as a result of being in a monogamous gay relationship, um, because. If you're not polygamous, if you're not operating like a polygamous way, then you don't really have anything to prove your bisexuality. Um, I mean, I've said all of this before. This isn't even juicy. This isn't an exclusive. Like, you're not getting anything that great. Um, but I, I spoke about it when I when I uh, interviewed with like Attitude when I first uh, jumped onto the LGBT correspondent role, and I said, "Look, I've had more relationships with women than men." Um, I've slept with more women than men, yet suddenly being the LGBT correspondent for the BBC, I was like, Ben's a gay! <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, it's, just, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, people want to put you into the easiest box that they possibly can. Um, so I just jumped into that. But I went to an all-boys school, a Christian school as well, and within that space, you just dated people from the girls' school. You didn't get to think about it. You just went and got a girlfriend from the girls' school. You just literally picked up anybody, and that was that. And you went to the cinema together, or like you went bowling or whatever else, and that was it. You just had a girlfriend. Um, so I didn't really get a choice to be gay or be straight or be bi. I was just, I just had a girlfriend. And then when I was outed, then I became gay within a school term. Um, I was outed for having slept with men, and so Ben was gay. 
I then went on and had relationships with women um, outside of my immediate space in London because women wouldn't date me in London. We'll come on to this, but they wouldn't date me in London. Um, and yeah, so I, I do feel like my bi card was kind of snatched from me. And I think that's probably the same for a lot of men within um, like the entertainment industry, especially. It's like you, I don't really feel the need to then scream to people, I've slept with women as well. Because it's like, <laughs> what does that achieve? <laughs> it's like, and who needs to know? But at the same time then, that does erase by people. Um, so complicated. Does it erase you? Mm, I don't really feel that deep about it. I think it's, for me, it's, as long as I, oh gosh, I've been on a journey since the pandemic, tell you, honestly. <laughs> when I was at the BBC, I was fully expecting kind of like to be in people's lives and to tell everything about myself and tell everyone about me. I've become such an introvert now. Uh, I am entirely happy with my relationship and with my family and with building the house I'm building. I'm like, I'm insular. So the time of me waving like a rainbow flag and being screaming in the streets and stuff, that's kind of gone. And I think there was a time when I was like a YouTuber, I was waving the bi pride flag, definitely. Um, but yeah, that time has since passed. Interesting. But for you, like you, you came out only a few years ago, right, as, as bi. Um, so that must have been a huge moment for family, friends, followers, everyone to suddenly be like, oh, I've been seeing you in a completely different light. Yeah, I, so my friends and my close friends and family certainly knew, my closest family. I think there's probably quite a lot of family members who are like, huh? <laughs> well. My book came out, huh? <laughs> Is she? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, also, I mean, oh man, I got accused of a family friend by, um, for performative bisexuality. What? Uh, it was Wowza. hilarious. Like, what commitment to a performance? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Performed a whole master as a whole book, and I'm here now. Um, I was like, well, I mean, if that's the case, then I'd, I'd somehow deserve it <laughs> anyway. Anyway, um, so there's, I think there's still assumptions of performativity. And my mom has been mostly, she, so my, I came out to my mom when I was uh, 15. I recently wow. left the age. Gosh. Because I was in a relationship with a girl. And she asked me, she's like, I recently saw her again, my ex-girlfriend, and we had a whole conversation about this. And Gosh. since then, I'm, I've been using her name because she said, go ahead. <laughs> 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 She's also bi. <laughs> we talked about it. Uh, so she said, so you've been spending a lot of time with Sarah. <laughs> Ooh. And that was the moment that I had to decide, do I uh, come out as lesbian? Or, well, she actually asked, are you a lesbian? And I said, no, I'm bi. And I, we couldn't remember if I'd actually used the term, but apparently I did. I don't know where I knew it from. I didn't know any bi people. I didn't see any bi people. Maybe the internet, who knows? Uh, but I, yeah, so I came out to her really early. But even there, she was mostly supportive. But whenever I had a girlfriend, she didn't want me to tell anyone. Oh. Like she didn't want me to tell family. She didn't want me to tell, my stepdad never knew I was bi, who passed away, I have a new stepdad now. Um, like until his death, he never knew. He would, like he would have been a surprise to him writing this book. Gosh. And she told me not to tell him, like it was explicit. And so. Why was that though? Why did she want that? I think she was trying to protect me from sexualization and homophobia. Gosh. And that's, and, and, I, and I understand why, because I, I'm sure she's heard things that maybe I don't hear. And she's heard not necessarily about me, but in general. And so as parents do, they try to protect people. And sometimes they do that in ways that I think are not good. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, she knew, and she was mostly an ally, and continues to be. And um, family, now my extended family's been wonderful. My friends all know. Uh, but coming out publicly, that was mm -hmm. absolutely terrifying. I was a scientist. I wasn't allowed to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> or a sexuality. Come on. Um, and I think that was something. I've always fought against the normative assumptions about what a scientist is supposed to be and what a scientist is supposed to look like. Because I remember being, I mean, just like I was a little candy-colored bi girl, I also was a little candy-colored academic. And I um, saw around me like all these people who looked a certain way. And it very much rewarded masculinity and things that leaned into masculinity. And Thanks. things that were feminine are bad. So makeup is bad, heels are bad, nice outfits are bad, dresses are bad, right? 
unfortunately not the only space like that. And so I pushed back against that there. And then the sexuality, I was like, this is going to be too much. Mm. <laughs> and I had a long conversation with my editor about it because I came out of my second book because I was talking about the monsterization of queer people and the villainization of queer people around the world and in the context of a book where you know, I talked about things that are, we associate with the word evil and quite a lot of people in the world associate homosexual behavior and related identities as evil. And so I was talking about visibility there and I'm still talking about visibility now, mm -hmm. but I wasn't visible. And so I realized I was being a hypocrite telling people to come out when I wasn't out. And so then I came out and I survived. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I'm here, and now I get to be with all of you beautiful bi people. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! So that's nice, and it was it yeah. was in fact amazing. I will say so. There, yeah. there has been biphobia, but there's been mostly such a beautiful community that I didn't know existed, that I didn't know I wanted, that I didn't know I needed, and yet here you are, and here we are making a beautiful bi space for ourselves. See, I always love hearing positive coming out experiences because honestly, my DMs are just filled with trauma and just the worst things that people have gone through, uh, especially on an international setting as well. So we're very blessed. Um, well, in 2022, maybe not so in terms of LGBTQ rights in this country, but I think we're very blessed to be in a space like this where we can even hold this conversation um, to be talking so openly. I would love to understand, um, in the book, you talk about what bisexuality looks like. And you say that you went to real effort to become more of a bi lookalike, <laughs> like someone that looks bi. What did you do and how did it go? <laughs> you taking notes? <laughs> how to look bi. Bye, Julia. Um, I, I have no idea what bi people look like. Um, turns out there's quite a lot of research on this because there's quite a lot of bi people who then, you know, when you make the choice to be visible, then the question is, but how? <laughs> and there is, and not to like wade into stereotypes here, but there are scripts for how to perform or look gay. Would you agree with that? Definitely, yeah, yeah. And there are scripts for how to look or perform being a lesbian. Yeah. But the question for me was, and the question for a lot of bi people is, is there an equivalent if you want to look bi? And uh, so there's been all this research on people asking people, like, what do you do to look bi? And is there a bi look? Can you spot a bisexual if you see one? <laughs> That's a good question, can you? Sometimes. <laughs> As uh, one of my gay friends once said, it's all about the eyes. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but I honestly, I have no idea most of the time, unless you have like a purple streak in your hair, in which case, 50% chance. <laughs> <laughs> so what they, what researchers found, and which is something that I have also played with when trying to fit into queer spaces and to present as more bisexual and be read as more bi, is often that people play with basically both um, lesbian and gay scripts, and or if you will, gender non-conforming scripts. And so you'll mix things that are a bit more mask with things that are a bit more femme. And now, of course, that entangles all kinds of things. But um, that is what most bisexual people seem to do when they try to look more bi. And there's something that I noticed mm. when I went to the first bi pride, which is fun. <laughs> uh, bi pride, which now also is going to exist in Germany, I think for the second year this year, and oh, wow. is going to happen again this year in the UK, and is a big Fun party, but also filled with activism, which is really interesting. It's also where I learned quite a lot of the lexicon for my early chapters. So when I started writing about bisexuality, a lot of the words I was using, I learned at Bi Pride. And then I went and did a master's and learned more from the academics. But um, in this setting, I also realized that quite a lot of people are really cute. Oh, and, well, I, okay. and I don't just mean the people. I mean, you're all cute, but I mean, <laughs> The style, there was a real leaning into like soft toys and like pandas. I'm sure that's because of pansexual, sure. Uh, but there's like <laughs> rainbows. We are all learning today. I'm like, what? And gumdrops. Uh, and I sort of leaned into that with my last sentence because it is a real thing. And I think, so my guess, I don't, there's no research on this as far as I know. My guess is that it's to combat the hypersexualization. It's like leaning against that with cuteness. Wow. And so that's my guess. But that, that surprised me. And I see it a lot. So I don't know if your experience is that. But 
in the Q&A, let's, 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 yeah, let's talk about that. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. Really. We're adorable. <laughs> Yay. Uh, I want to talk about being by and out at work. Uh, in the book, you talk about a study where um, people who mentioned they were bisexual in uh, cover letters were then rewarded with less money and less job opportunities uh, than people who said that they were gay or they were lesbian. Uh, and that was fascinating to me. I think you, you likened it, or the, the researchers likened it, to saying they were into threesomes and telling your employer that you're into threesomes um, in your cover letter. And just like, well, why would you do that? Uh, and that's exactly what they thought. Why would you do that? So coming out of work as a bi person, something you should do or something you should hold on to? <laughs> so that study, it's the only study I could find on bisexuality in the workplace, besides um, a couple of studies that just show that basically nobody's out at work who's bi, and that we're more, what, way less likely to be out at work. But in terms of the bi penalty, which is I think what those researchers called it, that was quite shocking mm -hmm. in terms of just overt discrimination, really, of bisexual candidates. And I think that is mostly the experience that bi people have when they come out at work Gosh. is, why are you telling me this? And that's the nice side of it in some ways. Um, and I mean, I've, unfortunately, no, because I've written this book, I also hear people's horror stories. And I hear, especially by men at work, especially in masculine workplaces, like say you work in a factory or you work in sort of storage, um, there's, there's more, I think toxic masculinity in those spaces and the more toxic masculinity there is, the less there is acceptance of what it means to be a man in all its forms and that includes yep. being bi. And so there is, you know, overt sort of avoiding and ignoring people at work who have come out as bi. Now that can also happen to gay people, of course. Let's not pretend that this is a, gay, a bi only thing. But there are bi specific things and the bi specific thing is that it is still associated with telling people about your sex life. And it's just, it just is. And it shouldn't be. Why should it be? And I think there were sort of, I sometimes say we're sort of 25, 30 years behind the conversation at work about people coming out as gay. So 25, 30 years ago, you would have expected in a workplace, unfortunately, if you come out as gay, to be told, why are you telling me about your sex life? And I think that that is just what is still happening to bisexual people. And so there's a parallel there, and we just haven't caught up because nobody knows anything about bisexuals. And so they have all these misconceptions and they say these things that are really exclusionary and act in ways that are harmful to bi people at work. So, but the answer, mm -hmm. my answer always to visibility is that none of this is going to change if we all stay invisible. And so ultimately, if you can be out at work, yes, there might be some negative consequences, but there will probably, probably also be other people who are thanking you for coming out and other people, like in my experience, saying, me too. And once you've got that allyship, there is strength. And once you have that strength, a revolution can happen. And so if you can't do it, please, for also for younger you, for other yous who can't do that, because without us, mm -hmm. those biases will persist. You mentioned in the book that you do drop the bi card as quickly as possible in conversations with, <laughs> with colleagues. Um, and I wondered what that actually looks like. <laughs> like, pow, pow, bi card. Uh, I think I do the same thing in the, in the gay way. Do you? Sense. Yeah, I think you have to in some ways. Like, it, it just chills the room, doesn't it? It's kind of like I sometimes walk in and I feel like a huge, like, straight presence <laughs> in like a scary way. And so just like playing the gay card and just being like, I have a boyfriend. So, oh. <laughs> it's like it's okay he's gay it's like it's, there is something about it that's just it does make people chill out I don't know what it is I genuinely don't understand it but it definitely I try to play the card as quickly as possible but also it prevents awkward conversations later on as yeah. well um, the assumptions that people will make uh, I guess it, it's difficult as well I guess from the by way because uh, if you are in if you're not in a homosexual relationship then you will still present as straight to some people. Mm -hmm. So they will still make those assumptions. Um, so how do you play that by card? I, in workplaces, mm -hmm. now have the luxury of being able to mostly choose the work that I do. And so it's different. So I understand that there's a huge power imbalance now to me and previous me even. And I, didn't, I wouldn't have had that luxury and I might not have risked losing a job or having any kind of negative treatment because of my sexual identity. Um, but now that I can, I say it as quickly as possible because 
if you're not down with the fact that I'm bisexual, this is not going to work. Mm, and it's go. the same in a relationship. My partner, Paul, shout out to Paul. Hey, Paul. <laughs> mm, Paul is shy. I was going to stand, stand <laughs> up and wait. Wait, 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 we love it, we love it. <laughs> Um, on our first date, I mentioned that I was bi because I also had had enough of it. I, I would wait till the third date or fourth date to mention that I'm bi, and there'd be two reactions. Oh, well, no, I don't really want a pol polygamous relationship. Mm -hmm. Or, assumption, right? Or, oh, I love threesomes. <laughs> but it was never for me, was it? Yeah. That was the pervy, porny glance of, ooh, one day you will perform for me, little one. And so... <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I have one man in mind in particular who's a bit bigger than me. Oh, no. Anyway, um, and, and also then when it actually came down to like me flirting with women, it would be like all hell would break loose. And you could just see the sort of, as soon as the realization kicked in of, oh, this isn't performative, suddenly it would be, Oh, well, I'm jealous now. And that was just, oh, I had enough of that. So I started dropping it first date, and it worked out very well. So thanks, Paul, <laughs> <laughs> for being down with the buys. Uh, so, so yeah, so I drop it as early as possible in lots of contexts, not all contexts, of course. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think, again, it's, made, it's improved my life. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to do it if you can as well. Love that. Um, I am going to get into Q and A. Let me just check the time. Okay, maybe in like five minutes. We'll keep talking. I like this. This is good. This is good. This is good. Um, the political chapter was probably my favourite one. Uh, like I said, I'm a dark cloud over a very fabulous rainbow. <laughs> so I loved it. It was just a real sense of where things are at currently. Um, you talked about. In fact, I've actually written down the first sentence of that chapter. You opened with your sexuality is political, whether you like it or not. I love that. Absolutely love it. And it's something that I, I try to get people to remember with all of my storytelling is, yes, it's going to make you feel something. Um, my stories, my reports, my documentaries, whatever, is going to make you feel potentially bad, potentially scared, but it's going to make you feel something. Uh, because welcome to real life. Like, this is where we're at. And ultimately, our rights are under attack. <laughs> it's that simple. So you need to understand that, yes, all of this is political. Within that chapter, um, you talked about... Uh, asylum seekers. You talked about how some or several asylum seekers in the UK who come to this country who are seeking refuge here struggle to prove their sexuality. Break that down even further and they struggle to prove their bisexuality. Um, the rates, I think, usually are around 30% for um, asylum seekers who come to the UK who are then successful in having their claims approved and they get to stay here. Uh, even less for those who are coming based on sexuality. Uh, for bisexuality, I don't even know if those numbers exist. I don't know if there's a, even a box for bi, um, because most people would have to be proving it based on a homosexual relationship. Uh, that research for me was really powerful. And the question to you is, how would you prove to a court that you are bisexual? <laughs> <laughs> it's all a performance. <laughs> uh, I don't think I could. So genuinely, I think th what I write about as well is that having to prove your sexuality or being accused of lying, being accused of uh, making up the fact that you are bi or homosexual, but also bi in this particular case, um, there's, a, there's a real lack of understanding within decision makers about what bisexuality is, that it's real, that it's not performative, just like all in wider society, and that it's, it's seen as a thing that's half homosexual and you can just like pretend not to be that half. So it's almost like you get to choose who, who you love or whom, wh you know, where your attractions fall. And unfortunately that's not really how, well, fortunately, but also unfortunately for people in oppressive countries, uh, that isn't how it works you fall in love with people you fall in love with, whether or not that you're legally supposed to do so. And so that is, um, that's something that people carry with them. And unfortunately, once you are outed as well, and someone realizes that you're bi, or you 
what they might call homosexual, but you might say bi, um, and say, actually, no, I, I'm attracted to men and women and other genders, um, that you can get kicked out of your family, you can get assaulted, the state can persecute you. Um, there's things for women, which is also applied to lesbian women, but sometimes specifically to bi women as a sort of forcing them into, well, typically heterosexuality. It's called corrective rape, which Gosh. is raping women to force them to show them that this is the way that they should go, which seems like the opposite of what would work. Um, but also is uh, just there's these horrible things that happen in the justification of like, well, we can just like force this queer bit out of you. And so there's the reality of that is that people who are seeking asylum, who have had terrible things, who have experienced terrible things, are coming to a space where they are trying to prove who they are in front of a people who often don't believe bisexuality really exists mm. or that it's not that big a deal. And, and you're not allowed to use, which is something I learned, in asylum claims about your sexuality, you're not allowed to use what are called sexually explicit narratives. Yep. In other words, you could be like, oh, I have this video of me having sex with multiple genders. They'd be like, no, no. Sex, no, no, no. Uh, stories about, di no. Yeah, you can't do it. What do you use? And so the answer is mostly that you get witnesses to talk about, oh, I saw him with, and yes, it's real, and no, it's not, and yes, and oh, and different genders, and yes, he did in fact love both multiple genders. And, um, but that is really, really hard to do as well, because if you are escaping an oppressive regime, who's going to stand witness for you? Who's going to put themselves at risk to defend you to go abroad? It's, it's really, really difficult. So I think for me, how would I prove it in a court of law? I mean, I would try and bring up witnesses to mm. say, did we date, I guess? Did, were we in love? Because we can't talk about sex. Um, and, and talk to like have my mom take the stand and say, yeah, she told me she was bi when she was, was younger. And isn't that I wild? Is it, I think even from like the, the gay stereotype perspective, uh, I was invited to parliament to talk about this actually when everything was happening with Afghanistan and LGBT Afghans uh, were coming to the country. And an MP was sat with me in parliament. He was like, Ben, we don't know what to do because we don't understand how to ask gay Afghans to prove that they are gay. And he, he basically laid out this criteria in front of me, and it was just like, all of these different charities have said all of these different things, and we're not sure which one to go with. Uh, and each of them had the most ridiculous list of gay stereotypes I have <laughs> ever seen. I was like, I shouldn't even be in this country. Like, based on, based on this, I should not have been allowed into this country, because I could not, genuinely could not prove I'm a gay man. Um, I don't really go out partying. I'm not out here sleeping with everybody, um, I'm not, I don't have pink hair, uh, I don't have like rainbow wristbands and stuff like this. E all of these things that are thrust upon these asylum seekers, um, many of us don't actually do. And then from the bi perspective, uh, the conversation went that they said, well, surely, I'm not gonna out this MP because it was biphobic, but he said, well, surely they could choose to be in a relationship that doesn't then put them in danger in their origin country. Um, what is your thought about that, actually? Because it, in some people would say that is true. They could potentially choose to not engage that side of their sexuality. Yeah, a sort of sexual camouflage idea. Ooh, yeah. Um, and that is definitely something that I think a lot of people think, just, just don't be bi, basically. And it is, in practice, something that, again, just, it can work, just like you can pretend not to be gay. Mm. Like in some ways that's not, not quite the same, I accept that, but it is related to the same argument of just like don't engage in that kind of behavior. Just engage in compulsory heterosexuality, marry the person you're supposed to marry, have a couple of kids and hide everything about that other part of you. And that is just not in a civilized society something that we consider a reasonable thing to ask people to do. And I don't think that it is a reasonable thing to ask people to hide their bisexuality, just like I don't think it's reasonable to ask them to hide their homosexuality. And that is the main thing when we're talking about things like immutability, so things that can't change. That is one of the major arguments for protections and human rights is saying, well, this is the thing that can't be changed about you and you are being judged or persecuted or harmed based on this thing that you can't change and you didn't choose. And so you deserve protections because you shouldn't have to pretend to not be that thing that you are. And for me, it's just the same argument, and we need a lot more clarity and a lot more education for the judiciary and for people who work on human rights to 
understand that. Yes. And a quick shout out, actually, if you're not aware of the Rwanda stuff that's happening right now and how that's going to impact LGBT people. I mean, I'm supposed to be going to Rwanda in the next <gasps> weeks. Are you? Uh, yes, to report on LGBT experiences over there. I mean, the first flight, I think, is next week um, for people who have come here technically illegally, um, who are now being sent to Rwanda for processing. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing that scared me about this, and reading through your book, it's, um, it's, it highlighted this even more, was the fact that for a lot of these individuals who are fleeing persecution, um, once they've actually gone through processing in Rwanda, they then get to stay permanently, if they're successful. So they don't actually come back to the UK. They stay in Rwanda. Um, for bi people, for lesbian people, gay people, who were then there in a country that doesn't necessarily actually <laughs> even appreciate LGBT rights at all, it's wild. Like, this government is doing wild, wild things. So please do read up about it and just understand what's going on within that, within that context. Um, I would love to understand more about representation and role models. We all talk about role models. It's something I say in schools every single week. You need to, you need to be able to see stuff. You need to be able to see it um, in order to be it. But who was there for you? <laughs> who made you realize what you could be? <laughs> I, I mean, I've had scientific role models, and so that was important for me. So seeing women in science who were very successful and were changing the way that we thought about things. So that was sort of in the first part of my life, I think that was in some ways the more pivotal role model and type of role model. And um, in terms of bi role models, because of the invisibility of bisexual people and it takes a lot of work to be and stay out and to be and stay in something that kids might see as a role model. And uh, I mean, I'm, I mean, the book, it's like today is the book launch and I'm already like done with the bi activism. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, this is so hard. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I love it, but uh, Making but everyone also, happy whoa. all the time, yes. Um, it? So it's... I have a lot of respect for people who have been fighting, like Robin Oaks, who is a bisexual activist in the US, who's been fighting since the 80s and 90s. That is, that is strength to keep that fight going. And to like Lani Kauhumanu, another US, so a lot of bi literature and a lot of bi rights, um, especially early, early rights were fought for in the US, particularly in New York which is also where Stonewall happened, and in yeah, San Francisco. And in those spaces, that's also why we have like the be included in LGBT, because Lani Kahumanu did, in the March on Washington, basically made a fuss and was like, we are also here! By the way, Lani, uh, again, a bi rights activist, um, first came out as lesbian because it was easier. Mm. Some come out as gay because it's easier. And well. then they decide later that maybe they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whatever. I mean, whatever. Um, <laughs> hypothetically. Uh, but she then later came out as bi and said, actually, this is actually who I am. And so it's, mm -hmm. for me, this is an important step. Um, so again, it's, I think it's important to remember that bi isn't just a step, like a step from hetero. It can be a step from homosexual as well. And it can happen at any point in your life. Like you don't need to decide on your sexual identity forever. As much as there is this argument, which I think is important, that you can't choose whom you love. So it's not a mutable thing. It's not something you're just deciding willy-nilly. Um, simultaneously, I think we should accept and embrace the fact that sexuality, all sexuality, can be fluid. As in, for some people, heterosexuality is their phase. For some people, homosexuality is their phase. For some people, bisexuality is their phase. And that's fine. Um, and you, different phases are potentially good for different parts of your life. Anyway, that was a long way of saying, Lani Kahumanu, was one of my idols for fighting for the B in LGBT. But when she fought for it, <laughs> we couldn't include bisexual because, well, that's too sexual. So they insisted that it's just bi. So it's lesbian, gay, bi, not bisexual. Which I thought was an interesting little fact that it in is. the first version of it, it was just bi. They cut the sexual out. Wow. But those are two of my, my heroes. Um, and then there's now there's quite a lot of, well, not quite a lot, there is some representation in film, like Villanelle, our favorite little bi-psychopath. <laughs> Does it make you feel good for <laughs> that representation is there? Well, as I write about in the book, there's a whole genre mm -hmm. of bisexual vampires and villains. psychopaths and villains. Yeah. 
uh, as unfortunately it applies to lots of queer groups. And it's the sort of the sexually excessive, manipulative character who wants everything and everyone all the time. And if you don't see it at face value though, like I think with Villanelle, to me it's almost, she's like a metaphor or a representation of women living outside the norm, then suddenly it can, you know, it's still the person you're rooting for. You still kind of love her. <laughs> and so in that sense, yeah, it's still by representation, yeah. even though we also deserve people who aren't psychopaths. <laughs> yes, we do, we do. Um, I'd love to open this up to the floor. Uh, any questions, 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 questions? Um, I think we've got a roving mic. I'm gonna make you work, Ooh. here we go. And uh, now you're even more by You can go to this person lighting. here, please. Right here with the glasses. Shout oh, out to- oh, on your left, on your left. There we go. Shout out to the lighting designer. <laughs> yeah, genuinely. Hi. Hi. Um, oh, I'm glad I have a microphone because it's <laughs> quiet. Um, thanks. This was really great. Um, I was wondering if you came across in your research or kind of through personal experience how you kind of kept a sense of bias in a monogamous slash um, re in a monogamous relationship when you're not with someone else who's bi. Um, yeah, because I feel like I sometimes struggle with that, and even if it's like a queer presenting relationship or a straight relationship, like not losing that part of myself. That is a common struggle that is found in the research on bisexual people, and there's sort of two forms of it. One is the mixed sexuality relationships that you're talking about. So if you're in a monogamous relationship, as you said as well mm -hmm. earlier, Ben, it, it makes it hard to show the bisexuality. Because you have nothing to show. You've got just the one person. <laughs> and so you're always assumed to be either, in your case, probably lesbian or straight. And so that leads to the struggle of like, no, but I'm, I'm still me. And in mixed sexuality relationships, so that could be if you're straight and somebody else, and your partner is bi, or you're bi and your partner is, is gay, um, that can introduce friction and a lack of understanding about sort of the unique aspects of being part of different letters within some sexual identities. So, I mean, I sometimes joke that my partner is the only reason I believe heterosexuals exist. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I like that. I love you. <laughs> um, but we're in a mixed sexuality relationship as well. And there, basically, there just needs to be conversation about that and what that means and whether or not that's that you have different ideas about what a relationship should look like and how to make sure that your sexuality, just like his heterosexuality, I don't want to erase you, um, <laughs> is, is important. Like, it's to keep that alive. And in bisexual research, that is often something that people talk about as like a mixed sexuality relationship as a, as a thing. There's also the invisibility of things like motherhood. So if you suddenly become a mother and you, again, the assumption is going to be throughout that the partner you are currently with well, A, it's mostly going to be assumed that you're heterosexual, and then if you are in a female-female relationship, the assumption is that you're gay. And again, there, it's sort of constantly trying to assert and show your bisexuality, and it can feel very erasing, even more than normal. So the answer is it's a shared experience, and I think the main way to come out is when you're called. So I have a friend who's dating a woman, and she regularly said, until recently, until I changed her mind, she just said, I'm lesbian, because it was easier, because she's currently with a woman. And so she didn't have to do the explaining. She didn't have to do the whole, like, oh, but is one person enough for you question, um, when clearly it was, because she'd chosen to be in a monogamous relationship with one person. And so she just said she was lesbian. And I said, I know you're bi. Why do you keep <laughs> saying you're lesbian? Like, you're doing us all a disservice, including yourself. So she's now changed her ways. But it, ideally, like, say it. Like, if someone makes an assumption about you that is incorrect, correct them. I like that. Great question. Um, let's go go down the front. So, gonna make you work. Gonna make you work. Let's do this. <laughs> On the way. Bam. Hello, Jaden G. I recently came out as a starfish. You got <laughs> to read the book to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very read very the good. Book. Um, so, my question is really, what what's next? I mean, you're you know, it's not your first rodeo writing books, doing research is kind of what you do. And I know you did just allude to it there, saying, okay, I've written my book now, kind of, that's it. I don't want to do any more bisexual activism. But genuinely, I guess, through the process of writing your book, like, there must have been things you learned or things you came across. You were like, okay, I need to look into this more, and I need to learn more, write more about it. So, yeah, really, kind of what next? And if it's anything related to what you learned along the way, what is it? 
It is uh, related, <laughs> and I. So I'm going to be doing some work with queer politics at Princeton and going to some countries where activism is needed to include various kinds of queer identities in the conversation and to create protections, legal protections for people who are LGBT plus. And basically I'm going to be there representing the B. <laughs> Being like, we, we are here too. And that is something I'm going to be doing this year. So I will be participating in a bit more activism. Uh, but overall, I don't know. I mean, I didn't expect I'd write this book or that I'd come out publicly as bi, for that matter. So I didn't, didn't see any of this coming, so I really don't know what's gonna happen next. I really hope that this book starts conversations and brings bisexual scholars and his, historians and figures in history and activists into a wider conversation. So I, I was really hoping this to be like an access point for a lot of people who are interested in bisexuality to use and to then work with. So in some ways that, that's what I see as my role, is sort of collecting stuff and being like, here it is. But what's next, we'll see. I will continue to be out as bi. I mean, as long as I identify that way, which I presume I will. <laughs> yeah, a bit hard now, um, whole book about it. But, <laughs> but yeah, so I will also be, so we're doing four episodes of bi people. So bad people, Any, anyone here listen to bad people? Uh, so Bad People, the podcast, there'll be four special episodes on bisexuality this month. So you may have noticed that they've just like changed the whole cover art <laughs> of the entire podcast to bi people, <laughs> which uh, the whole team, most of the team is bi, which is, which is nice. And we're bringing some of the stories, also things that aren't in the book, into the podcast, into a mainstream audience. BBC Ooh. audience. <laughs> Wow. They can't not see us when we're on their platform. <laughs> yes. So, which I'm sure was one of the reasons you wanted to work with the BBC initially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep talking about you. <laughs> so, bi people. So, I'm, we're, doing, we're putting out bi people, and I hope that that will also help some conversations uh, happen around bisexuality and introduce some people to their own history and related things. Yes. And also... Um, I am going to be going back to bad people and just regular criminal psychology. Yeah. Regular. My, my day job <laughs> as a criminal psychologist, which is the thing I have my PhD in as well. So I am, I am looking forward also to going back and sure, weaving queer stories and by, by activism within, to, within that, but mostly focusing on crime in general. She busy. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to get as many questions in as possible. So let's see. Yeah, let's go back up. Oh, to the gentleman there. Well, yeah, yeah, on your right. There we go. Do, do, do. There might. Oh, there's online questions as well. Oh, yes. Is that what you're going to say? No? I was going to say, there might also be one more book related to queer things coming. Oh, she even busier. There we go. <laughs> Come on. Love but that. It's a secret. <laughs> that I just told all of you. How exciting. Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about attitudes to bisexuality, different attitudes between men and women. There was something, there was some survey that came out last year that was something saying, um, women seem to be very open about admitting it, whereas men seem to, there's a, I, I don't know what the figures are, but a lot fewer men will say that they're bisexual because they seem to feel it's a threat to their sexuality. And Ben, you said something about women didn't yes. date you because you said you were bi or something like that. So, and it, that's interesting that men seem to feel that, but also other women seem to feel that when you said it. So I'm just, what are the percentages between them? And why is there that difference? Why do, why do women seem to be okay with it and men don't? So you're right that it's, as far as the, the various statistics that I've seen go, about half as many men are out as bi as women. So there's a massive gender gap. And I think the research on that seems to tie it to masculinity and to stereotypes around the, the idea that bi men are actually gay. And that's also something that is often seen in dating scenarios, yeah. is that as soon as you say you've had sex with men, it's like, oh, well, what, what are you doing with me? Yes. So that is something we need to deconstruct and accept that bi men also are bisexual and are no, no less valid than bi women. But again, the bigger problem is often that all of it's invisible and bi men are even more invisible. So there's like layers of invisibility going on and toxicity that comes along with that. Um, side note, I'm gonna also point out that you said admitted being bi just like came out. Yeah. 
Sure, it just, it, just in terms of language, it's always nicer to say came out or chose to come out rather than admitted because admitting sounds like a negative thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm just pointing it out. Um, so, so yeah, so there is a difference between men and women in coming out and um, yeah, I, unfortunately that, that continues to be the case. Curiously enough, the idea that women are more sexual slash more fluid slash are given more leeway in terms of exploring their sexuality, um, that is often something that we also see now. <laughs> Especially when we talk about things like, oh, I was, I was bi at university. That's the kind of thing you hear. It was my phase, right? The classic bi phase. I had a bi phase. And that's what often women are talking about, not men. And that is the opposite of what was the case when first research came out on sexuality. So both Alfred Kinsey and Fritz Klein, so Alfred Kinsey in the late 40s and early 50s, and Fritz Klein, who was a bi-researcher in the 70s and 80s, they both said there's twice as many bi men as bi women. I don't know when it switched, but sometime, some point between the 70s mm. and me being a kid, so 70s and 90s, at some point in there, that reversed, both in terms of the assumptions and the percentages. And I think it's probably because more men felt able to come out as gay, but I don't know. So I think for a while, bi was a softer entry point, whereas now it's harder. All I know is that the apps made it absolutely trash to be bi in London. It was damn near impossible. Um, and I, to the point, that I, I was wondering whether I was internalizing like paranoia about telling women that I was bi, because it would always be, I think it was easy with, it was easy with men, to be honest. Like, gay men would always be just trash in terms of being like, oh, well, I'm gonna turn you, or whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> but with women, it was, Conversations just fizzled out, like to nothing. Um, people would disappear. I had a couple of, like, the, the unmatching on Tinder, that was real, gosh. When you're like, having a conversation, the person just disappears, like what? Um, there were a number of occasions where I was really just surprised by people's reactions. Um, so like I said, yeah, to the point that I did think that it was me internalizing, maybe that their response wasn't as negative as I was thinking, and then I'm almost projecting what I'm expecting them to be like, um, and that's what's pushing them away. Uh, deep, deep. <laughs> <laughs> but it was tough, it was tough. And I know it's something that so many people experience in London. Like if you're, if you're a man telling a woman that you're bi on like a first date, I can't even imagine that. Kudos, I can't even imagine doing that um, because that, it would have just gone horribly for me. I know it for a fact, it would have gone absolutely horribly. I always had to just scatter the bi in the app somewhere on like the Tinder profile being like a little rainbow or something there that kind of alluded to it. Um, yeah, wild. Uh, any other questions? Let's go to, yeah, this person here, please. I think you talking about that kind of experience is really important because I think it is something that we internalize as us having done something or surely mm. we're overinterpreting, surely that's not what it was. It was something else. Yeah. And I think you saying that and then other people, perhaps even in this audience, saying, yeah, that is what happened. And maybe, I, like, we almost like gaslight ourselves when it comes to these things. Yeah. Of saying, mm, is it though? And it's like, yes, yes it is. That is, that is what happened. The win that I did actually find, sorry, we're coming to your question. <laughs> the, win, the win that I found with that was dating a bisexual. Okay. And when I dated a bisexual woman, that's when I was just like, oh my God, life can be easy. <laughs> like, we, I don't need to explain myself to you, get it. And I think I, I'm seeing that in a lot of my friends' relationships as well, that when they do date other bisexuals, they are happier. Um, anyway, <laughs> yes, your question, please. Leaving that one in the air. Um, so something I've been struggling with for a while is the bisexual ask, which, Ooh. The, one of the reasons I think um, for my sins I work in corporate diversity as well as being ardently and loudly bisexual. So that's a whole game. Um, but the so what question is often accompanied by like what next? If you come out as gay, it's like, oh, okay, you're going to ask for like equal parental leave or something. And even, I mean, obviously transphobia is rampant, but at least the asks are like relatively clear. Yes. You want like an inclusive loo and stuff like that. Like at least businesses and governments know what you want from them. Mm -hmm. And I think the bisexual question is like, do yeah. you just want us to be nicer to you? Is that, <laughs> you know, like, like, don't kill you and That's don't be a, a dick. <laughs> like, what is next for bisexual activism? In a little answer. Great question. <laughs> What's the ask? My ask 
is for corporations, if we're going to stay in the corporate sort of businessy space. Um, if you have rainbows on your walls, you've painted your bank in rainbows, okay, <laughs> now what? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that you should try and do, uh, certainly my ask would be, that if you have an event and you're inviting queer people to this event, and maybe you have a panel for your event, Good job. Maybe you're even, oh, bonus points, paying people. I mean, yes. <laughs> um, pay people for being there. Um, don't expect all this stuff to be for free, which is uh, still depressingly common. Um, pay people who are there and get someone who's by on stage. Like, we exist. We, we are around. You can find them. You can probably find a bisexual, oh, I know, in your workplace. Oh, <laughs> um, especially if you start having messaging that actually includes the B and talks about bisexual issues and erasure and challenges and euphoria and joy. And so saying the words and including it in your messaging and talking about bi-specific things is really important and making space on your stages for them is as well. And that's something I had, uh, I was speaking to a friend of mine who recently came out at work after many conversations with me, where I was like, do it, do it. And she, she was in a position of power, so it was low risk in terms of, you know, her not being able to continue in her career. And she, she said that she started by showing up at LGBT plus groups, and everyone just assumed, because she looks very stereotypically straight, everyone just assumed, and she's a mom, double points, right? Uh, assumed that she was an ally. And she's like, no, no. I'm the bee. <laughs> and then she went to an event a month later, and one of the senior partners came on stage and talked about being bi. And she was like, this has never happened. See. And she felt so seen, and she felt so included. And you could just see the energy that comes with that kind of visibility. So my ask is talk about bi people, include the word, include it in your messaging, and put bi people on stage. Love that. Love that. Um, can I check we've got online questions? Um, well, we have um, some very nice statements online, some very long, thoughtful really? statements. Really? Yeah. Um, Gosh, okay. Uh, there's a lot of people um, questioning, a lot of people who haven't, who haven't, who haven't come out as bi yet who oh, are wow. thinking Aww. about potentially doing so. Oh. Should we do one of them? Well, I mean, it's, it's really a little bit of a, a, long, not juicy? a long one rather than a question. No. So, um, but I mean, <laughs> it's around the idea that is it easier to come out as bi uh, when you're single? Ooh. Which is quite an yep. interesting one, and and also yeah, I think we can answer that. Okay, yes. let's go with that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, coming out as bi in a relationship is a minefield, especially if you're in a monogamous relationship. What what's yes. your perspective on this? I think almost says I think for me it is it's the proof element. People want proof, mm. and I hate that, but they do want proof. Um, when I was announced as an LGBT <laughs> correspondent, I went through attitudes comments on Instagram with people saying, why is this straight man going to be the BBC's LGBT correspondent? I was like, what? You literally saw black man, muscles, like six foot two, and four straight. And that was it. You hadn't done any research about me, hadn't looked into anything. You saw my photo and just assumed. Mm. People want proof. They want to see the proof. Um, so, like I said, for bisexual relationships, like, you need to prove something. And I guess if you are single, that is easier because you can jump between. Like, ooh, look at me, I'm bisexual. You don't but need to prove. Of course you don't need to. <laughs> but people, people want you expect to. Yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, there is an expectation. And there's, because of the deeply ingrained stereotype that bisexual people can only be satisfied by being in relationships with multiple people at once, which, by the way, also great, but not a bi <laughs> thing. Like, you can be consensually non-monogamous and heterosexual. Also, an option that lots of people yeah. are choosing that has nothing to do with being bi. That's just choosing to be in a relationship with multiple people. It's just assumed that for bi people, it's a necessity, yeah. which is a stereotype. And the problem is, because of that stereotype, if you come out in a relationship, you're often met with the assumption of, oh, does that mean you're cheating on me? Oh, does that mean you need more? Oh, does that mean I'm not enough for you? And that's the problem, is it's that that tension can very quickly arise. I'm not saying that we shouldn't challenge it, and if you are in a relationship, and you want to come out as bi, that is a good way to have that conversation as well. But you're probably going to encounter some negative stereotypes because of that. that's how we've been socialized. So yeah, right. single is better. Easier. Easy. Not better. Easier. Easier. <laughs> I'm like, ooh. <laughs> 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 ooh. Um, <laughs> uh, love and exclusive. Um, can we go to the back, please? Yes. To the person at the back of the glasses. There we go. Hello, thank you so much. 
Um, I was just going to ask, oh, so on the asylum issue, has anyone suggested taking people at their word and that actually, <laughs> and that actually I mean, coming, coming out to a terrifying Home Office official might be test enough? Um, that was a statement. Um, <laughs> and a good my, statement. My question was, um, do you draw a distinction between bisexual and biromantic, or does bi cover all of that? Um, and actually, referring to the Kinsey studies, there seems to be a lot of people who would be identified as bisexual, but maybe they wouldn't see their romantic destiny as being with somebody, with, with people of both sexes, so or all sexes. So, um, yes, that's my question. So I'm a big fan of using the big tent sort of idea of bisexual. And so anyone who thinks they are capable of or currently has or has had bisexual uh, attractions, so has had attractions to multiple genders that are sexual or, and or romantic, um, I like to welcome into my tent, <laughs> my bi tent, because I think there's strength in numbers. But ultimately, again, only you can know what the right label is for you. In terms of bi romantic, one thing that I found fascinating that is changing in the world around us, which I think is incredibly promising, is that when asking heterosexual identified people if the right person came around, would you be able to fall in love with them regardless of their gender? Over 40% of heterosexual identified people say yes. Wow. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So it's the sort of idea of, yeah, it hasn't happened yet, but it could. So I think it's, that is where I see the sort of, also the need or the desire to write a book where I see a lot of people who I think know about themselves that there's something there but they don't really know how to understand it, they don't really know what to call it, they don't really know where people like them are. And I really want more people to accept that within themselves and to embrace those moments when they're there. So I think it's, yeah, uh, the biromantic thing. I think there's a lot of people who identify as heterosexual who probably are open to love beyond gender, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love that. Um, I'm gonna do one more question. I'm just gonna push it, why not? Um, can we do this person just here? Yeah, 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 thank you. I just spotted my editor. My former editor. Hi, Rami. <laughs> He's the one who made bad people happen, and also by people. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, it really interested me at the beginning that you said that it's been difficult, and the reason why you wanted to write the book was because you didn't, you couldn't find the history, and there's nothing really out there. Um, I'm a secondary school history teacher, and where's the space in? culture and education and young people today for history curriculums and schools to start introducing not just bi but LGBTQ histories and yeah your perspective on that and I don't know if we're doing the best job yet well, God, I but, <laughs> but I think I think you know the conversation of getting people to think about their sexuality like for me personally I didn't, didn't question my bisexuality until I was like mid-20s because you know, it wasn't even asked of me, or <laughs> the history wasn't there. But yeah, I'd love your perspective on where education lies within that, and young people too. Yeah. So I'm enjoying the shift in some parts of the world towards more sex and relationships education that includes diverse kinds of family structures. And that is something that in the UK also, as we know, has changed recently. And there were massive protests, or not massive, there were protests, very loud protests against inclusive teaching of different kinds of relationship structures. I think that that is a really important step. I think that California is probably my benchmark as to how we can do it even better, which is that there is now a requirement in state schools, I think it is, there's always the state private division, which is a whole other conversation. But anyway, uh, that in state schools, there's now a requirement that schools include in um, their history classes and in their science classes, visibility for women, black people, yeah. and uh, queer people. And so there's a requirement that you basically normalize talking about who people were and to specifically, because I mean, how many of us went to school and we basically learned textbooks filled with only white dudes? <laughs> I know you hate the term, 
<laughs> white men. Um, but it's just like it was the same person over and over and over again. And yes, of course, a lot of white men had a lot of power and did a lot of research because they could. But to highlight the stories of subversion and resistance and other groups is so important because, if, as you said earlier, you need to see yourself in those fields. And that's where you can see a pathway to be that. And so I think it's crucial if we can, and as teachers if you can, to normalize talking about those people and their sexual identities if you know. So for example, if you are teaching queer history at all, like you're talking about Pride or Stonewall, to also highlight the fact that Brenda Howard was a bisexual activist who made, also known as the mother of Pride. Sometimes we heroize her a bit, but fine. Um, who made, was responsible for making sure that Pride, the Pride marches that we know today happened. And like almost nobody knows that. And you can just, that's like two sentences and suddenly bisexual people are visible. So I think weaving it in and normalizing it is, is the way forward. Awesome stuff, thank you. Um, I'm gonna wrap up the Q&A there. Uh, I would like to end on a positive note as well. In the final chapter of the book, you say that many people, um, for many people, being bisexual is an incredible thing. It's something they absolutely love. So we've touched on some trauma, we've touched on some deep elements, but I wanted to end with this uh, quote from someone that was involved in a study about various different aspects of bisexuality. And they said, rather than being this, not that, I am this and that, I felt like a blossoming flower. As I become more fully me, and as I'm more comfortable with each petal of my identity, I open myself up and look into the sun. I love that. Um, can I get a round of applause, please? For that?